talking about chaos engineering, right? How you can build humanity in the production systems using chaos engineering. Actually, Gregor kind of uh, talked about chaos engineering a little bit uh, in his demo today morning. So I'll just you know expand it more into what chaos engineering is, why do we need it, you know, tools and practices we need to adopt. So let's actually get started. So I'll start by uh, the definition of chaos engineering. Right? What is chaos engineering? So there, there's a wonderful website, principlesofchaos.org, and this is the textbook the definition of chaos engineering. And you see a tool called Chaos Monk. That's actually a tool. Netflix originated with chaos engineering, and they have this tool called Chaos Monk. So in a lot of books, you find this reference. But what chaos engineering essentially is, is that it's a live experimentation on your distributed system, right? And the goal of that experiment is basically to A, learn and understand what are the distributed system failure points and how to sort of give you a guideline on the areas that you can improve upon. Uh, that's what chaos engineering is uh, all about. And a common a common example of chaos engineering, I, I love this uh, example that, you know, when you're a kid, they give you vaccination. And what you're really they're doing is they're actually infecting you with the virus or bacteria or whatever it is, right? And the goal is not as much as to infect you, but let your body develop the resistance. So but actually you have some disease like that, you can recover from it. So chaos engineering is kind of the same thing. It's actually injecting failures in your system to build resiliency. But before I actually expand on what chaos engineering is, I want to start with why we actually so you know, any text problem, they teach you about all sorts of testing, <coughs> unit integration, security, etc., etc. And typically, how it happens is that when you when you build your system and you put it in production, you've tested your components individually together, how they're exhaustive, right? In multiple ways. So the question then is, why do we need another form of testing? Well, with all these testing, this the focus of your uh, test is actually on your actual system, right? How it behaves. So there is one thing missing in all of these tests, which is what chaos engineering actually does. And that one thing is how the system behave when it's actually running in an environment. So unit testing, even integration testing, their focus is on the code, not on the interaction between the code and the environment. So there are some nice examples, right? You see the traffic light and you test it thoroughly and everything works and it's deployed in the production environment and see what happens right it, it's basically useless the same thing can be said about that cupboard drawer so what is important in actual systems distributed systems is that you need to test the system itself and you need to test the environment on which that system operates and that's super critical and that's what chaos engineering mostly focuses on So the problem is that the world is chaotic, right? I mean, we are operating at a large scale. You're deploying your applications in AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, whatever your cloud environment is. And things fail at scale, right? There are many moving parts of a distributed system. Your disk storage, things things can go wrong. There are a couple of examples here, right? Uh, hard disk fails, network goes down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Point is, the world is naturally chaotic. So you have to, there's nothing, there's no way you can actually prevent that chaos from not happening. But what you can do is to be prepared for it and know what to do when it actually happens. And that's what we're going to see how. So people tend to ignore the environment, right? I know <clears throat> we, we deploy the application in AWS. It's AWS job to take care of all the environment works perfectly. Well, it is, but the problem is there are things that are beyond their control. Things happen. And you can't just ignore the environment, right? So when you test it, even if you have a staging environment, which is exactly a replica of production environment, there are differences. And you have to take into account. So this common example of Mars rover, right? You're, you're putting this probe in Mars. So you, you make an assumption of this is how my environment is going to look like. And you test, you know, like astronauts test for zero gravity on Earth, etc. You kind of simulate the environment on your local testing environment. But the problem is you have made a certain assumptions about the environment. This is how the environment are. How do you know 
that those assumptions are correct. I mean, you're making an assumption that fine, I'm uh, the network is reliable, is it? What happens if, if there's a network failure? The problem with the environment is environment is beyond your control. Once your application is, let's say, on AWS or whatever cloud, that's it. You can't control AWS, right? You can control your application, but you can't control your environment. So environment is something that you should not ignore. <clears throat> so there are common fallacies of distributed computing, right? We tend to make an assumption that we have a reliable network, bandwidth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, if you go to this website, they list you like eight fallacies of distributed computing. But the but the whole common point is that never make an assumption that your environment works perfectly. It doesn't, right? What you need to do is you need to take into factor what to do if things fail. So understand how your environment, how your system would behave in case of a failure. Build resiliency in the system itself. <clears throat> So one of the common failure conditions is cascading failure. So a distributed system, you know, there are these set of interconnected components, right? So one component depends on another component, that depends on another component. You, you test all these components individually, fine. But what if there's a component on the back end that fails and you don't see the effect immediately, but there's another component depending on it, which depends on another component, and eventually the failures kind of creep in. And what happens with these cascading failures is because there are so many moving parts of it, it's not possible for you to anticipate every kind of failure up in ahead, up in advance. And they're triggered usually by very unusual set of circumstances, right? Something that you never thought and you know, you have a problem with your system and your system is running in production safely, everything's great for one year, you think everything is good. There is some very, very, very unique condition that gets triggered and one thing leads to another and ultimately you have a crash. Turns out this actually happened. And this happened on February 28, 2017 in AWS outage. So this is actually the incident report. Uh, there was, this report was finally prepared by the CTO of Amazon, Werner Vogels. <coughs> so a lot of websites in US actually on the Eastern coast stopped working because of this outage. And what happened was a simple storage service, S3 service went down on the US East region. And there are a lot of other services that are dependent on it. So slowly and slowly everything starts shutting out and I think the outage lasted for four hours. And how it started as per the report was that one of the operators he entered some wrong set of commands. And you know there were like hundreds of thousands of websites affected. This is a perfect example of cascading failure. right? You may not be dependent on S3, but there are other services that you're dependent on who in turn depend on S3. So, if, even if S3 fails and you're not dependent on SP, your service is going to be affected. So point being, no matter who your cloud vendor is, no matter what your environment is, don't make an assumption that it would work fine. It just won't. So finally, let's get back to chaos engineering. What chaos engineering is, is it tests the interaction of your system in your environment. So typically in the stage, you know, you have the developer local machine, you do some unit testing, then you you know, you have multiple environments, one or more staging environments. But the focus of that testing is testing your actual build artifact. But once you deploy it to the code, there's a new set of tests that actually have to be done in your actual production environment. You could also do it in pre-stage and pre-production or staging environment, and many people do it. But it has to be done on that actual production environment. But actually tests and the focus of those kinds of tests are actually not as much as your build artifact, but the interactions you have with an environment. So that's what chaos engineering is. Chaos engineering is a controlled experiments that you do on your distributed system. What these controlled experiments are is they are basically injecting failure, some kind of failure, some kind of condition that could potentially happen. An example that I'm running a service and you know there's a resiliency built in, I have multiple instances of VM. What happens if one VM goes down? In an ideal world, you have a job schedule, right? You have a job scheduler that, that should detect that this instance goes down. It should shut down that instance, divert the traffic to other instances, come up with a new instance, and ultimately divert the traffic back. How do you know if it happens? So what you do is you inject a failure in the system. You say, okay, let me actually screw up one of my instances. Let me actually you know, shut down the instance, and I see what happens. That's an example of a controlled experiment, right? It's an experiment that you're doing that replicates 
what could potentially go wrong in your environment or in this case in your uh, in your cloud environment or cloud vendor exhaust gas engineering different from other forms of testing we already kind of a little bit talked about it but in all this testing you are actually testing one particular known set of conditions right so you're doing a unit test on one particular component you think this component can go actually wrong in abc manner and you test those abc manner right your unit tests are essentially a set of assertions that you make right did it happen did it happen if it didn't i failed chaos engineering is a little more than that because in chaos because in distributed systems you have many moving parts and you have many you know millions and millions of combinations of things that can go wrong it's not actually possible for you to enumerate all of them so what chaos engineering is more of a of a learning exercise what if this happens what do i do how would my system behave so it's it's a process of generating new information not testing for something that is already known it's more exploratory right you test the effects of various conditions and then you kind of generate more information and often this information is a little bit subjective it's not a objective yes or a no pass or fail it's like well the hard disk went down or this network failure my system did recover but it took me 5 minutes to recover so it's not a guess or a no it happened but it happened after 5 minutes that's unacceptable to me i want the recovery to happen in 30 seconds now that's an example of subjective information it's no longer a yes or a no fail so one of the common uh, misconception is like chaos engineering is about causing chaos well that's not the end goal chaos engineering is not about causing problems it's actually revealing problems right you already have problems in your system everybody has them there's no such thing as a perfect system but chaos engineering is doing is revealing them and if availability matters in your system but well, you should be testing for it so often the name chaos engineering actually you know sounds a little bit counter intuitive or if you go to an executive say well we're going to test your system by blowing up couple of instances in production how does that sound i'm not sure the cto would really buy it right so is so how chaos engineering actually started was uh, netflix actually uh, came up with chaos engineering and uh, around 2008 you know next we started and in 2009 they decided to go all in on aws they wanted to move to the cloud and i think the person in charge adrian cockra he's actually a very famous guy he speaks in a lot of conferences and uh, he's now at actually at amazon he's the vp of cloud architecture so he started that and with that transition what kind of happened was the environment that was up until that point was in your control now is no longer in your control because now you're relying on aws for that and i think around christmas or something there's an actual um, outage that happened and netflix was like kind of down for 24 hours or something at the peak peak season and that actually caused a lot of revenue so the whole chaos engineering concept was actually born from that point of view that these things are likely to happen and we can't control it we might be able to you know build resiliency that we would be able to recover if such a thing happens so they generated a set of tools um, it started with what is called as chaos monkey the stuff that you saw on slide number 1 right that's chaos monkey and chaos monkey was the most simple uh, form of tool so chaos monkey would just start with you know shutting down certain instances of a service and gradually and gradually they they you know they came up with a new set of tools and they named chaos kong chaos kong gained notoriety for shutting down the entire region and finally they have something called chaos automation platform and what chaos automatic platform automation platform does is that it actually periodically does live experiments on your running system 24 by 7 so they have they have a whole team one of my colleagues actually she works there they have a whole team they monitor they do it everybody knows and it forces the developer mindset that such a thing would happen don't make an assumption that it won't and build a real resiliency in your system right from the development stage so it's a it's an organizational um, shift or like a change of mentality of how you actually develop your software your development cycle itself has to incorporate the fact that you know failures are going to happen 
you have to take into account that in Braille resiliency right from the start. So they actually all these tools, Chaos Monkey, Chaos Kong, later on got uh, open source and they have now what is called as a simian army, we'll, we'll cover that, which is basically a set of all of these monkeys and you know animals that are going to cause all sorts of disruption. They're open source, so you actually can access them, there's a book on it also. So before we actually start uh, Chaos Engineering, let's actually talk about you know what are the prerequisites for Chaos Engineering. Well, as I said, chaos engineering is about generating new information, right? Chaos engineering is not about fixing known issues. So the first thing is, if you have a known issue in your system, then it doesn't make something like chaos engineering to work because, I mean, you already know there's a problem. Why would you do chaos? I mean, it's not going to generate any new information. The only information that you have is known. So the first thing about chaos engineering before you start to adopt chaos engineering is you at least fix all the known issues of your system. Right, that's the first uh, prerequisite. The second thing is that you're going to inject a failure and then you're going to observe what's going to happen. How would you observe it? Well, you observe it because you should have monitoring, right? So the second uh, prereq is that you should have adequate monitoring on your system. And I'm, I'm emphasizing the word adequate because, you know, monitoring, again, is a little bit of a gray area in the sense what kind of monitoring you have. And some monitoring might just, you know, monitor the instance of health, of services and so on, but you need like detailed monitoring, you need like logs, you need to know what's actually happening inside the system. So you need to have adequate monitoring uh, of chaos engineering. So principles of chaos engineering, like what are, how, how, do you, how do you incorporate, how does chaos engineering work? Well, your system is working in what is called as a steady state, right? You have certain hypothesis, I have a service, it takes a request, process it, write something to GD, whatever. And you're making in a sturdy state, ideal world, you're making some assumptions, right? My my resources are all fine, my network, hard disk, everything works good. And then what you start is start, you know, injecting these failures or very real world events. And these events are something that mirrors a distributed system failure mode. So what is a distributed system failure mode? Well, a distributed system failure mode is a possible configuration, a possible way in which your system can actually fail. So, so you vary. One example I pointed out was hard disk failure, right? So your service is, you know, service has 10 VMs, you have 10 disks, what's, what if one of them fails? So you, you sort of inject this failure and you, you have to run this experiments in production. You could also run it in a pre-production staging and usually most of the people would do because, I mean, if there is something wrong, it's better to catch it in pre-production staging than actually it goes in production. That does not replace production testing, it only supplements it. So you have these experiments running in your environment, your actual environment, and then you kind of automate it. So that's what the Chaos Automation Platform does, right? It's an automation, you need to run it, you know, there are different ways of doing it 24 by 7, you need to have team monitoring, etc. And there's a concept in Chaos Engineering that says minimize blast radius. What minimize blast radius is, is start from small. Like, don't don't inject a big failure like two of my three regions fail right from the start. Start small because if, if you inject a failure and if you inject a big failure and things go out of control, you may not be able to recover it. You start with something very small, right? One instance of one service, probably a tier three service. It doesn't even have to be, it shouldn't even be tier one or tier two failed, right? So you've, you've isolated a very small failure that probably does not impact the customer directly. And thing works, good. If everything doesn't, you've identified a weak point, fix it. It's like an iteration, right? So now we know that on tier 3 services, one of the resources is we are fine. Let's actually move to tier 2 now. So we do the same thing in tier 2, you know, you inject a failure. So essentially, you start with a very small blast radius and you gradually increase it. And ultimately, your goal is that if a big failure happens, either the service should recover or at least fail gracefully. Um, in Netflix, I think they have something like that, that when you actually uh, log in, you see the recommendations of all the movies, right? And if, if the service that fails, your, your stuff would still work, except you just won't have the recommendation. So that's a graceful failure. Right? It doesn't really affect or 
terribly affect your user experience. Sure, you might not have recommendation at that point of time, but if you are watching or if you are looking to watch one particular movie, you can still do it. Nothing stops you from doing that. Okay, so we talked about experiments, right? I kind of briefly touched upon it, but there's actually a sequence of steps that you actually have to do. So you first start to pick an hypothesis. So let's let's have an example. My hypothesis is that I'm immune to disk failure. Then you pick the hypothesis. Let's actually pick a scope. Scope is kind of a minimizing blast radius kind of velocity, right? So this this particular failure affects the set of services. So that's my scope, right? I'm going to inject a failure. If if this thing fails, what are the metrics I need to observe in order to see what's happening? You know, so observe metrics could be like I don't know my uh, my response times, my thresholds, you know, my throughputs, which sort of decrease, some kind of some kind of metric that using so you identify certain metric and then you do is you notify the organization hey I'm doing an experiment right so it shouldn't come to them as a surprise like, what the hell happened you obviously tell them ahead of time and you actually run the experiment so you run the experiment you have the metrics you collect that information you analyze the information and if if things work as expected good you increase the scope and this is the automation cycle that you have. And things that don't, you have identified a failure, fix that, repeat that experiment, and continue. So this is the experiment in cycle that, you know, pick, pick a metric, define what is normal, inject a failure, and observe the difference. So here, what you have is you have two groups. You have a control group and you have an experimentation group. Actually, it kind of, you know, in, in, in medicines and in all this, uh, in all this fields, you kind of do it, right? You, you're testing a new drug. So you have a control group and you have an experimental group. Let's say if you're testing, I don't know if it's ethical to test in animals, but whatever. You have a control group and you have an experimental group and you kind of observe the difference, right? So chaos engineering is kind of the same thing. The good thing is you're not harming any animal or human in that process. You might be destroying the system, but still better than harming anyone. And then, you know, you, you, I, you observe if everything works fine, good, you increase the scope, you repeat it, and if things don't work, there's a discrepancy, analyze the result, you've identified a weakness, and fix it, and repeat the experiment. So that's the experimentation cycle. Chaos Monkey, uh, we kind of talked about it repeatedly, there's a, there's a source code for Chaos Monkey, how they did it, actually included in the link, so you actually can see, and they have good documentation also on it. So Chaos Monkey is like the most basic form of testing. Uh, Pick an instance, switch it off, observe the effect, and then you observe if your job schedule level recreated or not. If not, then you have identified a weakness. And if yes, everything works fine, then at least you know that when the actual server restart happens, you don't have a problem. So different kind of experiments that I have. Like, I mean, obviously this is not an exhaustive list. These are some of them that you could potentially uh, be facing. Um, and one of the things is, it's not always a binary yes or a no thing, right? Something failed, something passed. Sometimes it's just about latency. My network works, but it's slow, right? So I have Kafka, I have like whole sets of brokers, producers, consumers, one topic accidentally got deleted. So there's always a concept of partial failure. And again, it goes back to the statement I made that chaos engineering the information you generate from it is a little bit of a subjective in nature. It's not always a yes or a no, but it's all about like, you know, there are numbers involved, there's like gray area in between. So you have all sorts of experiments, you know, let's say your function through an exception. Were you able to recover from it? Or were you able to gracefully fail for it? Injecting latency, Kafka, time travel, whatever you can think of. Simeon so what Simian Army is, is it's actually a set of tools, Chaos Monkey, Chaos Kong, and a whole bunch of tools. And these tools, all they work together to essentially try to destruct your system. And if you can survive this army, then you're happy because you know when the actual outage happens, you will be fine. Um, there's again a link, GitHub link for Netflix, so you actually can check and see what uh, 
interesting and I'll move on about. <clears throat> so adoption in an organization. Now this is actually a little bit of a challenging thing. And why it is challenging is because there is a mentality shift, right? You're actually doing something live with production that can impact the revenue. So it's it's hard for executives to buy it. You know, when when the idea first came in, I mean nobody was buying it until they actually faced the issue. That what happened with Netflix uh, during that Christmas break. So, and also adoption is a little bit complicated because in an organization we have 50 teams, some people feel they are ready, some people feel they are not ready. So typically adoption is not a yes or a no again, but there are strategies around adoption, right? There are strategies around some team says, well, we, we are willing to participate, but we don't want you to do anything in production. We are fine with you know pre-production environment and that's about it. Some people will say, well, we are not ready, sorry. And some people might say, oh, we are confident everything is good. So typically how it happens is that there is a, there's actually a kind of a configuration that you have to create. Um, when my team was working on Chaos Engineering at Jet, what they had was they, they developed all these tools, Chaos Monkey, Chaos Strong and so on. And then we had a set of configuration for each team. So they can configure what are the services that they can opt in and opt out. And we kind of monitor it in the sense that you shouldn't opt out everything. Or you can opt out everything, but if you do it for long, then there's something wrong, right? You're not building for resiliency. So there's a, that configuration aspect of it. Some team should be able to opt in and opt out. And then you need to automate these experiments, right? They shouldn't be, they shouldn't be like one-off. Uh, you could probably start with something like one-off experiment, but eventually, if you, as you go into sophistication of it, you want to do an automation. And you have to be willing to experiment in production. Why? Because that's your real environment. We talked about you, you want to test your interactions in your actual environment. Even if you do it on pre-productions and you think that you're actually, you're fine, you're making an assumption that pre-production is identical to production, in my opinion, no two environments are identical. You can get close, and if there's something wrong with pre-production, definitely you can identify that and fix it. So you don't have to go to production in that case. But you can't ultimately skip experimenting in the production environment. So they have a concept of game days. And game days is like a fire drill. Right? So when you have a fire drill, your manager tells you, well, there's going to be a fire drill. and everybody vacate the office in the morning 10 a.m. and there are emergency points. There are actually two emergency points here also, by the way, in case you didn't notice. And everybody is supposed to assemble. And what you're doing is you're actually simulating an actual outbreak of fire. So game days is basically a practice that adopts, uh, that uh, companies adopt to actually kind of simulate it. What they have is they basically in my company, they usually have teams competing with each other, right? of whose, whose service is more resilient and usually you have a prize money for the team or actually some, some dinner outing or something. But game days is basically a collaborative environment where everybody will work with each other to, to simulate failure, to understand their system, to build resiliency and you know you there are obviously controls that you have to build around it. Right? You have to have a success criteria, you have to have a board criteria if things go out of control. Uh, you obviously need to have some dashboards, you're monitoring some metrics and so on. And you need to like really practice it. Okay, these are the failures that we are going to inject. This is going to be our roll black plan if things go wrong. These are the criteria, success criteria and so on. And it usually involves everybody. So right from sea level down to the lowest engineers. It's, it kind of involves the whole organization. It's a great kind of team building opportunity. You know, you learn about the system, share knowledge chaos maturity model. So typically, a chaos maturity model basically measures uh, what's your adoption of chaos engineering or how, how sophisticated of chaos engineering practice you have in an organization. And there are two dimensions to it, right? There's a dimension of sophistication and there's a dimension of adoption. So I'm going to examine each one of them in details. Sophistication, right? Sophistication simply means that how uh, how advanced is your practice of chaos engineering. So typically, there are four stages here: is elementary, simple, advanced, and then sophisticated. 
and in an elementary you start very simple right element elementary uh, stage you don't really run on your production you might run on your local machines on your at best on your pre stage and process is very manual there's no automation involved in it and you might have something very simple so you might have like you know disk restarts network failure and so on and once you feel that's confident you move to relatively simple but better than elementary stage and there you have a you have more sophistication on it right you have like experiments that actually run on production like traffic so what you could potentially do is you can you know not as much as a divert or like you know so probably divert or just keep take an actual production traffic load and then apply it on your system and see what happens um, in a simple also results are somewhat manually uh, manually aggregated and analyzed but it's actually running on a production traffic and then you have more more expanded events you kind of want to bring some kind of cascading system uh, cascading failures also into your system right finally going from simple you have advanced and in advanced you would start having experiments that are going to run in each stage of your system so you have it you know you have like a typically local dev environment goes to your build pipeline build pipeline as one or more pre stage in environment you'll have a unit testing integration environments whatever so you start incorporating chaos pretty much in all of them and uh, most of it is automated right and experiments start having a dynamic scope so experiments start having the loop of you know I'll start with small blast radius increase it gradually and gradually and finally that's the most advanced and before that you have a sophisticated also which is also semi you know experiments kind of run in productions but um, you know there might be some frameworks etc and you might have to do something manually manual terminations and so on so the another dimension to chaos maturity model is adoption how much how how much is your uh, organization adopting it right so you start with uh, the shadows in the shadows they like to call it so you have few systems covered and then this this is usually how chaos engineering would start that some other teams say hey, we should do something about it there's no organization wide mandate right and they are kind of an early adopter they might do some infrequent and then you move into something like in investment where at least the higher management buys in okay this is something we should be doing and slowly and slowly you have some resources dedicated to it you might have multiple teams and so on gradually moving to something like an adoption right where you now have a dedicated team and this is where most of the sophisticated organizations would have they actually have a dedicated team that actually works for chaos engineering and then you have a more complicated incident response system that if something happens you know the person on call is notified and you know critical services are now starting to practice and then you finally have like you know cultural expectation you have like built in all critical services would be tested you know chaos is a reg regular part of engineering development cycle it's a regular part of onboarding participation is like the default behavior you you should not opt out unless you have a very good reason to do so so there are a lot of organization that use netflix obviously um, started it um, a colleague of mine Mike, does it at microsoft uh, my previous employer which was jet.com acquired by walmart so they do it and there's this whole bunch of uh, companies that actually form it some of them obviously not everybody is at the same pace some of it practices it relatively less adopted some of them are more adopted but they are it's actually entering a kind of a mainstream uh, discipline so there are plenty of resources um, for basics you just start with the wikipedia page then uh, principles of chaos which is like the official chaos engineering page then if you want to implement the tools there's actually a chaos toolkit so chaos toolkit basically will have chaos monkeys and all those tools sort of libraries that you can take to build your own tools um, chaos iq is actually a consulting firm it's run by a guy named Russ Miles, so Russ Miles and Associates. Uh, he's also a very frequent uh, speaker in many of the international conferences. And then there's this company called Gremlin, and Gremlin actually were the people in Netflix who originated with Chaos Engineering, and they decided to leave Netflix and you know sort of commercialize these ideas. So that's what Gremlin is. There's a book on it by uh, O'Reilly about Chaos Engineering. So ending towards the conclusion. environment is something that you cannot ignore right it means your interactions to the environment that needs to be tested 
and failure is something that's bound to happen. So rather than you know putting yourself blind or saying you know failure can't happen, embrace it, know what happens, know how to deal with it. And for best resiliency, you need to continuously run these experiments in production. And what chaos engineering ultimately does is it builds confidence in your system, right? You know your system can withstand failures, you know when it can gracefully degrade, where and when necessary. Uh, thank you.